Okay, let, let's start. Uh, welcome to today's lecture. Uh, the 2020 Nobel Prize in Economics was awarded to Paul Milgram and Robert Wilson of Stanford University for their work on auction theory. Today we have with us Shushil Bikchandani, who is a former student of Bob Wilson, to explain to us their contributions to auction theory. Uh, Sushil graduated from Stanford University and he has been working at Anderson School of Management in UCLA ever since. Uh, he himself has made seminal contributions to the theory of auctions, herd behavior, information economics. Uh, so today's talk uh, will be for about 45 minutes and we'll take questions after that. Uh, if you have any questions in the middle, please write it in the chat box and we'll take it up later. Uh, okay, so the floor is yours, Sushil. Awarded to Paul Milgram and Robert Wilson for improvements to auction theory and inventions of new auction formats. So I'll restrict attention to the work for which they've gotten the prize, namely auction theory and also uh, contributions to the practice of auctions, but uh, be mindful that they've made seminal contributions to several other areas of economics and towards the end, I'll just list those other areas as well. So this is part of their work, but they have done work in other areas, very important work in other areas of economics as well that I shall talk about later, okay? Okay, so auctions have a long history the first historical record of uh, an auction is in, in Babylon around 2500 BC, or no, around 500 BC, 2500 years ago, that's a typo, uh, in, by, by Herod, Herodotus in Babylon. Uh, and, uh, but it's only recently that auctions have been studied by economists, mainly by economists. Okay. Uh, the study of auctions started uh, with uh, about 60 years ago with Vickery's paper in 1961 uh, for which he got the Nobel Prize uh, over 20 years ago. Um, so what he studied was the independent private values model. Okay. Uh, so uh, the way uh, most uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the most people lo look at auctions is by the rules of the auction. What are the do you submit, uh, how, is it a seal bid auction? Is it a open auction? What are the rules that determine who's the winner? That's an important way to classify auctions, but an equally important way to classify auctions is by having some model in mind and as to uh, what the values of different participants in the auction look like, okay? So the way economists also classify the auctions is by the distribution of values of the uh, bidders in the auction. What's the most that they're willing to pay? And so the first set of papers on auctions, the underlying assumption about the model was the, each uh, bidder had a value, a maximum amount that they were willing to pay for the object being auctioned. That's, and that was privately known to them and perhaps independently distributed across different bidders. And that was studied by Vickery in 1961. And uh, his results were significantly generalized by Meyerson uh, 20 years later. Meyerson also got the Nobel Prize uh, about uh, in the last decade or so for his contributions to auctions as well as more broadly to implementation theory uh, along with, uh, with Maskin and uh, uh, also Hurwitz. Uh, Maskin has also made important contributions to auctions. Um, Wilson came in uh, later in the decade, uh, in 1969, with a new model, uh, what's called the common value model for auctions. And the impetus for this I'll explain in a bit as to why it was, what was the, the necessity of uh, a common value model, what, uh, why was the independent private values auction model uh, inadequate for some types of auctions. I'll discuss that in a bit. And Later, in the early 1980s, Milgram and Milgram and Weber generalized that model that uh, made it more expansive and obtained results in this more general model for 
how the values of the bidders are distributed, okay? So that's one way to classify auctions uh, with some understanding of how to model the willingness to pay of the participants in the auction, okay? Uh, I should mention here that uh, I have in mind auctions where the seller is the auctioneer, okay? Uh, think of uh, 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 auctions for, uh, 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 say, say, say uh, government securities, the government auctions it off and buyers pay money to buy it. You could also have auctions where the buyer is the auctioneer, procurement auctions, which is also common. And the theory is interchangeable. What applies to the case where the buyer is the auctioneer uh, applies with a little bit of translation to cases where the seller is the auctioneer. But just for concreteness, I'll talk for the most, for the most part as if the auctioneer is the uh, uh, auctioneer is the seller and the bidders are the buyers. Okay. So uh, that aside, so these are the three different types, th three different uh, uh, types of valuation models. Okay. Uh, and the other way to classify auctions, and I'll talk for the initial part about auctions for a single object, only one object is being auctioned, one indivisible object, or more generally, there could be more than one object, but every buyer, so again, the auctioneer is the seller, uh, and the auctioneer is selling multiple objects, but every buyer needs only one object, okay? It applies to that as well, okay? Uh, so there are two basic formats of an auction, Either it's a seal bid auction where the bidders submit a, a bid for a, a price that they are willing to buy the object at, and no one else gets to see what each bidder submitted. Okay. And you could have a first price seal bid auction or a second price seal bid auction. And the other kind of format is an open format where more information becomes available during the auction process. So the classical open format is the English or ascending price auction, where the auctioneer might call up ever increasing prices and bidders, they might be in a room or they could nowadays be remote somewhere connected on a computer terminal, indicate whether they are interested in buying at the current price that the auctioneer announces. So that's an ascending price auction. And the reverse, the, there's another open format, the Dutch or descending price auction where the auction starts at a very high price and the price keeps coming down until someone claims the object. So in the open format, some information becomes available which may or may not be useful to the bidders in submitting their bids. Some information may be available during the process of the auction, okay? Okay, and there are other details that I will not discuss, uh, important issues, but uh, just so as to uh, focus on of uh, two or three important characteristics. I won't discuss them, but uh, things such as the minimum reserve price below which the auctioneer will not sell the object, entry fees to participate in an auction, uh, in an open uh, disclosure of bidder identities. Sometimes even in a sealed bid format, uh, bidders may not know how many other bidders they are or who they are. Uh, it's up to the auctioneer to decide whether to may announce that. And uh, Oftentimes the auctioneer would like the bidder to make a deposit of some money with the auctioneer before the, the auction, just in case that bidder wins and then can't follow through and pay the price, the winning price for the object, okay? So all those precautions uh, and details are important and they lead to lots of different variations amongst these four basic forms of auctions, okay? But I won't discuss these variations today, okay? Again, I'm uh, describing some basic uh, background before I can get to the contributions of uh, uh, Wilson and Milgram to auction theory. So in a first price auction, bidders submit sealed bids to the auctioneer. The highest bidder wins and pays what he bids, okay? Examples, so in the US, uh, oil companies, private oil companies, uh, uh, Exxon, Mobil and others, uh, the extract oil from oil leases that are tracks that are auctioned by the Department of Interior uh, to private companies and they have the rights over a certain period of time. The winner of the uh, auction has the right over a certain period of time to extract all the oil there is or they could have uh, uh, sell rights to 
to wood that's on government land, trees that are on government land for, for wood. Uh, so these are uh, a first price auction is a seal bid auction. You can think of a multi multi object version where every buyer wants more than one unit uh, and they might submit price quantity pairs at this price. I'll buy so much at this lower price. I'll buy this much additional amounts. Uh, these uh, 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 multi object generalization of a first price auction is used by the Reserve Bank of India to sell government securities. Second price auction, again, it's a seal bid auction. Uh, bidders submit seal bids to the auctioneer. The highest bidder wins and pays the amount of the second highest bid. And you might wonder why would an auctioneer want to do that? Why not go for the highest bid? They can pay the, what they bid. Well, uh, bidders are just according to the rules. They tend to bid more if it's a second price auction than they would have if the same object were sold in the first price auction. So a priori is not clear which of these two might yield a higher revenue for the auctioneer if that is the objective of the auctioneer to get as much revenue as possible. Okay. Examples of this, well, uh, the RBI uses a variation of the first price auction to sell government securities. The US Treasury uses a variation of the second price auction, the multi-object version of it, to sell government securities. And a variation of the second price auction is used in Google keyword search auctions. Okay. So these are the two seal bid auctions. The descending price auctions, well, the auction starts at a high price at which no one is interested in buying the object. Okay. And then they keep decreasing it until someone claims the object. And that's the end of the auction. It's a single uh, object auction. Okay. Uh, it's used to sell flowers in Alsmeer in Netherlands. So uh, this kind of an auction is a great place for those who like, a great auction to have for those who like lots of stress. So I went to the, a few years ago, I went to Alsmeer to observe this auction. There's, it's Alsmeer is very close to Amsterdam airport and they have a huge warehouse over hundred acres where, probably not these days because of the pandemic, but in normal times, flowers are shipped from all over the world to Amsterdam airport and brought to Alsmeer warehouse. And every, every day, uh, uh, the, 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 these, uh, these lots of flowers are auctioned off and in a, in a room where auction, the, the buyers are assembled and in a trolley in the bottom of the room, uh, the, a sample of the, of the item being auctioned is displayed and the clock keeps reducing the price until an auctioneer uh, a buyer claims the object at the, at the price cut then displayed. Okay. So the, lots of smoke in that room when I was there. I don't know if smoking is still allowed there, but obviously it seemed very stressful for, for the buyers there. Ascending price auction. The auction starts at a low, pr low price where everyone wants to buy, every bidder wants to buy that price and the price is increased and bidders keep dropping out as the price keeps increasing. And once they drop out, they can't re-enter usually, okay? Until only one bidder remains uh, and they pay the price at the current price, okay? At which the last but one bidder dropped out. Uh, you've seen uh, uh, auctions being conducted in movies, uh, auction houses like Sotheby's and Christie's. Uh, an auction on eBay is similar to this. There, instead of an auctioneer raising price, it's the bidders who keep incrementing bids until uh, uh, there's only one bidder le left or the time runs out. So these are variations of the ascending price auction. Okay. There is some uh, similarity between auctions in a seal bid format and an open format. Okay. Again, I'm uh, only talking about single object auctions. A first price seal bid auction is strategically equivalent to a Dutch or descending price auction. Okay. Uh, think of a seal bid auction. Uh, before you submit a bid, you think about how much you value it. And based on whatever information you have, you decide that this is the bid you will submit. Presumably something less than your uh, valuation should leave you some profit margin if you win. And the same kind of calculation goes into deciding when to stop the clock in the Dutch auction. Because if the auction is still running, well, you've learned that no one else has taken the object, but that's not that's the assumption under which you submitted a seal bid in the first place. So the two auctions are strategically equivalent, okay? 
uh, and then the second price auction and an English or ascending price auction. These two are equivalent in the independent private values model, but not more generally. Okay. So to summarize what I said, a first price is same as a Dutch auction. So I won't talk about a Dutch auction at all. Uh, they are strategically equivalent no matter what the valuation model. And in the independent private values model, a second price auction is equivalent to an English auction. Okay. Uh, and they both will generate the same outcomes in, the, in uh, independent private values. Okay. So let me say a little bit more about the independent private values model. Okay. So each bidder has a private value, VI, known only to the bidder. Okay. And he knows for sure what that value is. Think of this as the maximum amount that the bidder would pay for the object. They wouldn't be prepared to pay anything more because it's they don't value it so much. They don't value it more than VI. Bidder I doesn't value it more than VI. And the values are independently distributed. And Vickery introduced the second price auction and showed that if the valuations are IID uniform, then there's uh, revenue equivalence between common auctions, namely between first price and second price. First price and Dutch auctions are always equivalent. And in the independent private values model, uh, second price and English auctions are, are equivalent. Okay. And <clears throat> the expected revenue from a first price auction and a second price auction is the same, uh, not just when uh, VI are IID uniform, but more generally, as was shown later by Myerson and uh, Riley and Samuelson and Raviv and Harris. Okay. <clears throat> Again, as I mentioned, in, in a second price auction, it's uh, people will raise their bid compared to what they would have bid in a first price auction. And that is basically why the expected second price, second bid, highest bid uh, in a second price auction is same as the expected highest bid in a first price auction. And you get revenue equivalence. Okay. This is again, uh, in equilibrium, okay. Uh, the underlying equilibrium concept being Nash equilibrium. So, Vickery's interest was not so much the revenue, but the incentive and efficiency properties properties of a second price auction. A second price auction has this property that it gives participants, at least the bidders, uh, their marginal product, what they bring to it, the table, and that. Uh, is associated with lots of uh, uh, interesting incentive properties that were uh, described by Abba Lerner, uh, a market socialist about, uh, uh, in, the, in the 1950s. And that piqued Bikri's interest in coming up with uh, a second price auction. And uh, it's also known as the Bikri auction. And Myerson, I, I mentioned Myerson earlier, showed that amongst all possible selling mechanisms, not just the common forms that I had mentioned a few slides ago, amongst all possible selling mechanisms, a second price auction with a reserve price, a, so an optimal reserve price maximizes expected revenue. So it does better than any of the other mechanism you can think of. You can think of, well, trying to sell it today with a reserve price, if it doesn't sell, maybe you come back a week later or a month later and try to sell it again. No, it, that doesn't do better. As long as you can commit to a certain mechanism, the best you can do is have a second price auction with reserve price, no matter what. So it's a fairly general result. And the methodology he used in this paper is applicable to um, a much larger set of uh, uh, problems than just auctions. Okay. Okay. So I mentioned that uh, Wilson came up with a common value model. And the question is, what was the need for coming up with a different model? So examples where a private values model, independent or not, a private values mo model might be a good fit is where the items being auctioned uh, are being purchased by the buyers for personal consumption. They have some idiosyncratic value for it. It could be antiques, art, vintage jewelry, uh, things that people aren't buying to be able to, uh, so that they can resell it later. It's just, they want to buy it and keep it for their own personal use. Okay. So a private value model might be uh, <clears throat> a good fit, 
Okay, it's not that there may not be a common component to it. It's just that there's no uncertainty about the common component. You're looking at vintage jewelry or jewelry more generally. You know what the price of gold is. Everyone knows what the price of gold is. So there is no common uh, component that there is any uncertainty about. And whatever differences in values remain is because of idiosyncratic differences that uh, values that people attach to consumption of these items. Okay. And examples where the private value has been is not a good fit is uh, auctions of oil leases. Okay, uh, oil companies when they try and acquire rights to drill for oil on a tract of land or an offshore oil tract, well, they're uncertain about the amount of oil there. There may be none. There might be lots, and they're also uncertain about the prices, uh, price of oil over the next 10, 20, 30 years, or which it'll take to extract the oil. Okay, so there's significant common component to the valuation, and. The idiosyncratic component might be because of differences in cost, but maybe that's not so important. Okay, uh, financial assets. I mentioned government securities, but other assets also auctioned, and uh, uh, IPL players, cricket players in the IPL league, uh, they also auctioned off. There's a significant reason why everyone wants to pay. Every IPL team wants to pay more for players like Virat Kohli. Okay, so there's a significant common component there. Private values is not a good fit in these models. Primarily because a bidder in these auctions is unlikely to know his value with any degree of uncertainty. So the value is unknown. And second, there's a significant common component to a bidder's value. If one bidder thinks their estimate for uh, an oil tract is high, well, other oil companies might also have a similarly high estimate. Okay. So there's correlation across uh, estimates for that reason. And there's a common component. So back to the contributions first of Wilson, then I'll talk about Milgram. I'll go chronologically. So in 1969, US oil companies were losing money on offshore oil leases, okay? So till the 50s, most of the oil tracks auction were onshore. Then in sometime in the late 50s, early 60s, most of the tracks being auctioned were offshore. And that was a different ballgame altogether. It was much more difficult to estimate the amount of oil. It's a different kind of a geological structure. And the oil, the reservoir was much, uh, there's a huge amount of uh, water before uh, the sonars could get to the rock formations where the oil was buried. So the estimation was much uh, more difficult about the amount of oil. And previously used bidding models, which use primarily private value kind of models, could not account for something called the winner's curse. Winner's curse refers to a phenomena where the winner of an object, of an auction, ends up paying more than what the object is worth. So they end up losing money. So it, it can happen one off on auction here and there, but this is happening consistently. On average, they're all losing money. Okay. And that's when Wilson. Uh, provided the impetus for him to say, wait, wait a minute, private values doesn't quite uh, seem the right model to use. One should go with the common value model, okay? Also known as the mineral rights model because of the origins of uh, uh, this model in 1969, okay? He introduced the model. And this was the first theoretical ana analysis of the winner's curse. I'll have more to say about the winner's curse in a few slides, okay? So the common value model of Wilson, a single indivisible object, he analyzed the first price auction. And he looked at the model with two risk neutral bidders, each with a common unknown value V. So in a private value model, different bidders had different uh, values. Here, to first approximation, let's assume the value is the same for all bidders, except no one knows what it is. The value is unknown, okay? And each bidder, privately observes an information signal, Xi, about V, the value, okay? So they have their own uh, geo geologists who go around uh, trying to sense how much oil is in the structure that is being auctioned. And also the economists who try and estimate what the future prices of oil will be. And then bidders submit bids, seal bids, it's a first price auction, based on their signals. So that, that was his model. <clears throat> and note that Xi is an unbiased uh, 
estimate of v. The expected value of v conditional on xi is just xi. Okay, so some people might overestimate, some people might underestimate, or some of the time uh, your, your geologist might overestimate, sometimes underestimate. And similarly for your economists who estimate the price of oil, but on average they are right. Okay, but the key thing to note, Wilson observed, was that the winner's estimate is biased upwards. Okay, and the reason for that is if say bidder one is the winner, and there are two bidders, one and two, then if uh, uh, that, that uh, tells bidder one some information that bidder two's information estimate, his signal, wasn't that high. And if the bidders are symmetric to a first approximation, similar uh, errors of estimation, similar bidding strategies, then uh, one can conclude that x1 is greater than x2. And this conditional expectation on the left, which is the uh, uh, expected value of the object, conditional on bidder one signal, and conditional on the information that bidder one is the winner. This, as you can see, uh, is less than expected value of v given x1 without knowing that they won. And that's equal to their the signal initially. Okay, So once a bidder knows that they won, this is all now. Maybe it wasn't worth as much as I thought, where initially this is what they thought it was worth. And indeed, they are they're right about that. Okay. And therefore, when a bidder submits its bid, they don't know if they're going to be the winner or not, but they should submit a bid predicated on the assumption that they are the winner, because that's the only time they care about what the object is worth. Okay. And therefore, they should uh, <coughs> shade their bid below their estimate for two reasons. One is to allow for a profit margin, which is what they would uh, assume in a first price auction, okay? But also to compensate for the winner's curse, the fact that winning is bad news for the value of the object. Okay? And this effect is absent in the independent private values model. Okay? And so a common values model requires more sophisticated analysis than a private values model for this reason. Okay, uh, a couple more things about Wilson 69 before I get into more details about the model. Uh, so Wilson was the first to use Harsani's formulation of games with, one of the first to use Harsani's formulation of games with incomplete information that should be incomplete, not complete. Okay. Uh, and he used Bayesian Nash equilibrium as a solution concept. Harsani is another Nobel Prize winner. He got the Nobel Prize in 1994, along with uh, John Nash and Richard uh, and, and with Anne Zelton, okay, uh, for his 1968 paper primarily. Uh, and Wilson, before System 9, had a, a paper that was can be thought of as a stepping stone towards the 69 paper. Uh, the 67 paper looked at a common value auction with extreme asymmetric information, with extreme winner's curse, where one bidder knows the common value and the other has no information about the value. So there's severe winner's curse. And after analyzing that paper, it's a, a somewhat simpler analysis. He went on to uh, Wilson 69. And uh, a student of his, uh, Armando Ortega Reichert, generalized uh, <coughs> the results in. Uh, Wilson 1969 in his uh, PhD dissertation in the 1960s, but uh, uh, he didn't publish his uh, his, pay, his his results. He, uh, he he disappeared after that. Um, okay, so back to the winner's curse. So, as I mentioned, this conditional expectation, expected value of v given x1, bidder one signal is an unbiased estimate of the value before auction results are announced, okay? And if bidder one is declared the winner, then as I mentioned, this is an overestimate of the value. Uh, that should be V not V1, uh, V1 is the same as V2, okay? And this here is the unbiased estimate of V because this takes into account both uh, the two pieces of information, one bidder one signal, and second, that bidder one is the winner, which implies that bidder one signal is greater than bidder two's signal. Okay. 
And the relevant estimate to base one's bid on is this conditional expectation that takes into account the information that bidder one is the winner. Okay. And so in equilibrium, someone doing sophisticated analysis like this and taking into account the bad news curve conveyed by winning, uh, winner's curse is not an equilibrium phenomena in the sense that on average, winners, bidders who are sophisticated and take this phenomena into account will not lose money. But as we'll see with some data in a bit, if there's a sudden change in the kind of objects being auctioned or if something totally news offered where people might uh, make wild estimation errors, then uh, the, 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 they might consistently lose money. Okay. So again, uh, to some, uh, uh, I've mentioned this before. Okay. So XI, the conditional expectation V given XI, which is just XI, is unbiased ex ante and ex post, it's biased up if I wins and biased down if I loses. Okay. <clears throat> and an estimate based only on the winner's uh, signal and not on condition on the fact that the signal was highest amongst all the other bidders is will be optimistic. Okay. And just for concreteness, let's look at a simple example where bidder signal is just the sum of the true unknown value plus an estimation error which is normally distributed with mean zero and variance sigma squared. Okay. So think of sigma as the uh, how accurate your estimation is, the smaller the sigma, the better. And you, one can do a calculation to see that. Uh, so the uh, maximum possible uh, estimation error is what the winner will have, will tend to have. Okay, you'll be the most optimistic estimate amongst all the possible estimates of the different bidders. Okay, and if the winner were to use this xi as their estimate to submit a bid, then they'll tend to be uh, an overestimate. And that depends on the standard deviation sigma, the estimation error, as well as the number of other bidders there are. If there's only one bidder, okay, it's not really an auction, there's no, oh, there's no over, overestimate. But if there are two, then little over half a standard deviation is the expected value of the maximum estimation error. So the estimation error could be positive or negative, but the maximum of two will uh, be positive on average. The expected value is 0.56 sigma, and it increases as the number of bidders increases. Okay. So <coughs> the, the winner's curse gets worse as there are a number of other bidders because then we, uh, the number of other bidders increases because then winning is, winning is even worse news about the value of the object, you beat out so many other bidders, okay? They all had lower estimates than you did. And second, the larger the estimation error, the larger the sigma, the more careful one has to be about winner's curse. One needs to shade one's bid more, okay? So with that uh, in mind, that analysis in mind, let's look at a couple of uh, pieces of data, okay? This here is from uh, winners in offshore oil tracts uh, in the US. Okay, uh, these were uh, <coughs> auctions for uh, rights to extract oil from tracts uh, or off the shore of uh, Louisiana, here off uh, Santa Barbara, in the Gulf of Mexico, in Texas, and in the <coughs> in the in the uh, in the Alaskan Sea. Okay. <coughs> And the highest bid in each of these is a lot more than the second highest bid, as you can see in each of these four different auctions. These were first price sealed bid auctions, okay? And the lowest bid is a fraction of the highest bid. Uh, and the money left on the table, that's the difference between the highest bid and the second highest bid. That's how much lower the winner could have bid and still won the auction, is quite a bit. And uh, the highest to lowest ratio, especially uh, goes from 10 to seven to 109. Well, uh, in Texas, they brag about, they want to do, they do things in big in Texas. Well, they leave big amounts of money on the table in Texas, at least in this auction, 
as you can see. Uh, and Alaska also 26. So this was a time when, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the oil, uh, auction, uh, oil lease auctions had transitioned from land auctions to offshore auctions where the estimation errors were much larger. Sigma was much higher. Okay, And people didn't adjust for that, that the estimation errors were larger, winner's curve is much worse, and they need to be shading their bids over their estimates much, much more to account for it. Okay. Uh, so the oil, oil industry was not making any money on these. They were, their average return on these uh, offshore oil tracks was comparable to what they might get if they put the money in a savings account in a bank, which is, has almost no risk. Okay. And they were not being compensated for the risk that they were taking uh, because they were not accounting for the winner's curse. And these three gentlemen, petroleum engineers at ARCO published this so that in the hope that other people would realize, their competitors would realize that maybe they should be bidding less. Okay. So they didn't make too much money, but don't feel too sorry for them because a few years later, in 1973, OPEC raised oil prices tremendously and then they made lots of money after that, even on these offshore oil tracks that were still productive. Okay. So that's one example of winner's curse where the, or the transition to a new kind of object being auctioned with greater estimation error. And there was the winner's curse. And the second example is closer to home. This is winner's curse in telephone rights for auctions in India in 1995. Uh, <clears throat> so here, uh, these were, uh, until then, uh, these are rights for providing landline service, not not mobile phone service. Uh, so until then, uh, the government had a monopoly in providing uh, telephone rights, and people had to wait for years to get telephone connection. So the government decided to uh, allow the private sector in. And okay, this is no one's made money in this business. Uh, you can't look at uh, what the, the government monopoly was doing to see how much, uh, what, what are the economics of, uh, of, of, of providing the service. And uh, there were 13 licenses being auctioned and a firm that no one had heard of before, Himachal Futuristics Communications Limited, was the high bidder in nine out of these 13 licenses. Again, it was the uh, first price uh, auction with two licenses, two licenses in each circle. They wanted some competition, <clears throat> and the rules were that uh, that uh, uh, the price would be equal to the highest bid for each of the two licenses, even though the second highest bid was much lower. Uh, and the, uh, so th there was no way in which uh, uh, the firms that were the second highest bidder were going to pay this much more because they didn't think it was going to be uh, worth so much. Okay. And the amount, so these are in dollars, billions, so you can convert this into rupees, crores using exchange rates at that time. Uh, Himachal Futuristics had no way of paying this, this amount of money. And the government said, okay, they changed the rules after the fact and said, well, no one can, be, can get more than three licenses. We don't want another monopoly. And that let HFCL off the hook and there was litigation uh, because the second highest bidder also didn't want to pay, for, pay the highest bid to win. Uh, and things got bogged down for a long time as a result. But that's another example of winner's curse where something totally new has been auctioned and people, the winner is going to be the one who is the wildest overestimate of the value of the object, as you can see from these numbers. Okay. Okay. Um, let me now move to Milgram and Weber. And I'll focus mainly on uh, Milgram's contribution. I'll, I'll focus mainly on uh, Milgram Weber that builds a general model that has uh, private values as well as common values of special cases. And uh, this, a, a version of this model was introduced earlier by Milgram in 1981. And this was uh, uh, deepened and, 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 and uh, uh, the, the additional result, much a, a broader set of results were obtained in Milgram Weber 1982. Okay, so this analyzes private values and common values. One can argue that no one has exactly the same values. All companies might have uh, different budgets, different costs of extraction and so on. And so 
maybe we need a model that has both some uh, variation in value, private values, but also a, a strong common component. So the bit of i's value is vi, it's not v. So vi could be different, v1 could be different from v2, except it's not known to the bidder. And bidder gets an information signal xi about vi. Okay. <clears throat> and the expected valuation is a function of all the signals, x1, x2 through xn. And bidder's expected value is conditional on x1 and x of the other signals of the other buyers. Of course, the bidder only knows his own signal, not the other buyer signals, but if he knew uh, other signals, that would be the valuation, the expected value, okay? And nowadays, this is referred to as the interdependent values model as each bidder's value depends on our own signal and on the signals of other bidders. This expression over here, okay? And special cases of their model, think of a simple model that uh, it's basically a linear combination of all the signals as over here. So this xi is the private component and the average of others or the sum of others, you can include xi in there, this is a change in constant, is the dependence, is the common component, okay? And this has private values as a special case. So if A is one over here, you get the private values model. If the XI is, and if the XIs are independent distributed, then it's independent private values. And if uh, A is zero, then you get the common values model, okay? So this combines both and has private values and common values as a special case. So that's their model. They introduced uh, the concept of affiliation in, uh, to economists these random variables, the values of the end bidders and their private signals are affiliated. This is, uh, for the statisticians amongst you, this is uh, total positivity two, okay? So it's stronger than positive correlation and it is related to pretty much equivalent to monotone likelihood ratio property introduced in Milgram 81A, okay? And what Milgram Weber did was obtained a Bayesian Nash equilibrium in common auction forms, first price, second price in English auction. Remember, first price is still equivalent to a Dutch auction over here for a single object auction. And then they obtained expected revenue uh, rankings of these auctions, okay? And they showed that on average, an English auction yields higher revenue than a second price auction, and a second price auction yields higher revenue than a first price auction, okay? So revenue equivalence no longer obtains. And again, you could put uh, reserve prices and so on, if you like, okay? Uh, so they sh basically provided, uh, for auctioneers interested in maximizing their expected revenue, like players in the private sector, uh, then English auction is the best, followed by second price, followed by first price, okay? And the intuition behind this, they explained with what they call the linkage principle, okay? Basically, the payments of bidders are linked to additional information in, uh, you can order the, the information that's incorporated uh, in some measure to the winner's payments in these three auctions. In a second price auction, the winner's payment depends not only on their own uh, uh, bid because then they, uh, that uh, cost, uh, made them bid higher than the second highest bidder. It depends on the second highest bidder's information also, okay? Uh, in an English auction, the winner's payment depends on information of all the losing bidders. So imagine an English auction where the prices are rising and uh, bidders see who dropped out first and at what price, who dropped out second and what price. So you can incorporate that information and the bidders who remained as the price is increasing, if they see people dropping out sooner than they anticipated, they might revise their estimate of the uh, object down. Or if they see people persisting longer than they expected, they might revise their estimate of the object up, okay? 
So linking a bidder's expected payments to others' information weakens the winner's curse. There's more incorporation information being incorporated in the auction process, in particular, the expected payment of the bidders. And this in turn leads to more aggressive bidding. Okay, the winner's curse is less important. You end up shading your bid of, uh, less than you would have without that information on average, not in every instance, but on, the, on average. Okay. And it also implies that Honesty is the best policy for the auctioneer, as they pointed out. So whatever information the auctioneer might have about the value of the object, uh, they should pre-commit to sharing it with all the uh, bidders. Whether it's good information or bad information, they should share it. They, as long as they have a, <coughs> uh, people believe that they do that, again, it'll uh, weaken the winner's curse and uh, the increase the revenue. In an extreme case, if the auctioneer knows exactly what the value is for all the bidders, they should announce it and everyone will bid up to that price. And the bidders will make no money and the auctioneer makes all the money. The, the entire pie goes to the auctioneer. Okay. So that was the uh, underlying uh, intuition behind the linkage principle that they uh, discovered by analyzing the model. Okay, that's it for uh, single object auctions. I'll move on to multi object auctions or unless uh, there are any questions which I can get to later or now, I'll leave it up to Debushis to decide that. He's looking at the chat window, I think. We can we can move ahead and take the questions later. Okay, okay. All right, oh, I see that I have exceeded my time already. Okay, uh, uh, let me <laughs> see a few words about auctions of uh, multi object auctions. In 1979, uh, Bob Wilson uh, had a paper called Auctions of Shares, where instead of indivisible objects, he looked at divisible objects with a common value, common unknown value. And after observing a private signal, each bidder submits a bid. Think of uh, multi-object versions of the second price auction, where people su submit a uh, continuous demand curve. Okay, and example, we're selling government securities in the US. Uh, the selling price is obtained by equating the supply, the fixed amount of supply, uh, the now object being sold with the aggregate demand from all the bidders. And the way the intuition gets modified from a single object auction is that now there are three reasons to shade one's bid below the value, profit margin, the winner's curse, and your price might be inframarginal. Your price might be the one that de determines the market clearing price for everyone, okay? Your price lower down, so, and you don't know which, uh, where that lower down is, so you want, you want to shade your bids all over, okay? The demand curve. And perhaps uh, of a greater pr practical import is uh, uh, <coughs> this case over here, indivisible objects with complementarities. So this was uh, re related to spectrum auctions, auctions for bandwidth that are used by cell phone companies, for instance, to, for, to, 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 to run their operations. Uh, these are characterized by complementarities where some bidders might value getting, uh, 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 let's say this example, you have spectrum X, spectrum Y, and this is a very simple example, bidder A, uh, the other wants the two together on it doesn't value spectrum X or spectrum Y separately at all. This could be because there are two different uh, bandwidths, two different pieces of the spectrum. You need one to upload, to uplink the other to downlink. And if you just have one, well, you can't be in business. Whereas bidder B, they all already have an existing operation. They maybe want uh, have enough demand and they want to uh, just have a broader bandwidth to cater uh, to the demand and all they need is just one of these spectrums. Okay, so for them it's a substitute, either they get X or Y and if they get both, they only have use for one or maybe their evaluation might be 11 or 12 for both instead of 10 units, okay? So this is the maximum that they're willing to pay and let's just for simplicity assume that the bidders know their own valuation, okay? The question is which 
non-combinatorial non auction is likely to achieve the efficient outcome. So the efficient outcome, I have bold face that, is to allocate both units of spectrum X and Y to beta A, because that uh, yields a total pi of 15 units. If you give both to B, you get only 10. If you give any one to B, you get 10, and the beta uh, A has no value for just one of these pieces of spectrum. And so that the efficient, efficient, efficient outcome is 15. The question is, which non-combinatorial auction is likely to achieve the efficient outcome? Why non-combinatorial? Well, so what's a combinatorial auction here first? Well, people would be allowed to bid for X alone, for Y alone, or for submit a separate bid, a third bid for X and Y as well. So all com bids over all possible combinations are allowed. All possible packages are allowed. And uh, if there are two pieces, uh, two objects being auctioned, that's simple enough to implement. But if there are 50 different spectrum, which is uh, a small spectrum auction, that's a, a total of 1,000 trillion different packages. And there's no way, it's not feasible to for people to A, submit that much information and also to optimize over that. So uh, non-combinatorial auctions are non-starters for the, for the most, most of these auctions. So if there were simultaneous sealed bid auctions for the two, one for X and one for Y, then there's an exposure problem for bidder A because bidder A runs the risk of ending up with either X or Y, but not both. And then he's paid something that's worthless to him. And that will, maybe he won't want to participate for that reason, okay? So if bidder B decides that <coughs> I'll bid, uh, bidder A decides that he bids seven for each X and Y in the hope that he gets both and leaves some profit margin. And bidder B might decide that they'll bid uh, just uh, eight for X. They'll win, uh, will spectrum X, B will, and uh, bidder A will win, win spectrum Y and regret it. Okay, so that's an exposure problem that bidder A has. And another kind of problem that might happen is a free riding problem. Okay, bidder B wants only spectrum X, bidder C wants only spectrum Y, and no value for the other, and bidder A is same as earlier. Okay, think of uh, spectrum for North and South India, bidder A has neither. Bidder B has spectrum for South India, Bidder C has spectrum for North India. They want to have a complete footprint. So they want just one of the two items being auctioned. Okay. Now this creates, again, which uh, the efficient outcome is to give X to B and Y to C. Okay. Uh, and a, a non commutator auction is not a seal bid auction, something a seal bid auction for to spectrum is not like, likely to achieve uh, uh, because there might be a free rider problem here. Bidder B may say might bid low for X, submit a bid of let's say five or six, okay? And let it be known that she bid low. And then C now has to bid high, maybe nine, to make sure that A doesn't get the object, okay? Uh, doesn't get uh, Y and so. Uh, and, and X also. So there, there could be a free riding problem also if you had uh, simultaneous auctions, seal bid, or if you had sequential auctions, same kind of problems might arise. And so this problem gets magnified to a much larger extent when there are 10, 20, 50, or several hundred items being auctioned at the same time. So uh, the solution to this is a simultaneous ascending price auction, one for each of the items being auctioned, what's called a simultaneous multi multiple round auction. So there are two objects to be sold, then <clears throat> the two ascending price auctions, they are held simultaneously for one for each object and bidding occurs in multiple rounds. In each round, bidders are free to increase bids in any auction, okay? And auction ends when no one increases the bid on any object in a given round, okay? So if you reach a round uh, where no one increases the bid, then <coughs> the auction stops. And there are activity rules that force bidders to reveal their interest early. So these auctions go on for hundreds of rounds, 
it would take weeks sometimes. Uh, and a bidder might decide, okay, I won't reveal my hand. I'll just come at the end and start raising the bids on uh, uh, items that I'm interested in. Uh, a little akin to what people might do on eBay, whether the definite ending data is well, which uh, exacerbates that problem. Uh, here, there is no ending date. It ends when no uh, people stop bidding. Okay, so this auction was the outcome of two propos proposals made in 1994 to the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission in the U.S., which is in charge of it's a government body in the U.S. in charge of selling spectrum. One proposal was by Mildred and Wilson, and the other was by McAfee, another famous uh, auction theorist. Okay. Um, and th this is what came off of it. Again, informed not so much by, informed by some modeling, but more their insight into how auctions worked and also supported by some experiments done in laboratories to see how, how different uh, tweaks to these rules would work. Okay. And the SMR is simultaneous multiple round auction. It alleviates, but does not totally eliminate the exposure and the free Riding problem. It was first used in the US in 1995 by the FCC. And versions of the SMRA have been used throughout the world since, generating hundreds of billions of dollars of revenue for governments. So it works, it usually works well, not in every instance, but sometimes too much information was revealed to the bidders and they used that to uh, send messages to each other. Uh, but all that, all those tweaks have, for the most part, been ironed out by now. And more recently, another type of mechanism called the incentive auction was proposed by Milgram and Siegel for trading spectrum by private firms. Private firms might have uh, bandwidth that they don't really use, and others might have uh, demand for them. So some kind of a double auction system uh, uh, for buying and selling spectrum was set up by, suggested by Milgram and Siegel. Okay. Okay, I've gone on for too long. Uh, so uh, I was going to spend some time. Uh, they done so. What, what I discussed now, the, especially with the FCC auction, was very practical things that they did. And this is back to abstraction, uh, whether markets uh, aggregate information uh, efficiently, and the. Uh, in the 70s, Wilson and Milgram and early 80s had papers that spoke to this. I won't spend any time on this. And they also had uh, uh, <coughs> made contributions about the allocative efficiency of market mechanisms like double auctions and other trading mechanisms. And uh, again, I'll skip that in the interest of time. So let me conclude by uh, just listing the contributions to other areas of economics, first by Paul Milgram. Both Milgram and Wilson and co-authors started the uh, area of reputation formation by rational and irrational agents. Milgram's made contributions to game theory, industrial organization, organization economics, financial economics. These are all seminal contributions. There are many more papers than this. And similarly, Robert Wilson has also made contributions to reputation formation, game theory, bargaining, and pricing. So what I narrated was their contributions to auction theory, and they are known for many other things apart from auction theory, both of them. Okay, with that, my end of, thank you very much for listening, and uh, that's the end of my presentation. Well, thank you, Vic. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for a clear presentation. And uh, it's very late in California. You stayed up so late to describe of the auction theory. And uh, so now I will take up some questions from the chat box. Uh, so let me see what are there. Um, so one question Prajwal Gupta asked that in Milgram and Weber 1982, if the signal acquisition is costly, that is, the auctioneer does not distribute information freely. Will the ranking of expected revenue uh, remain unchanged? So uh, I don't recall if they uh, dis discuss. So, so okay, the entry fee can be thought of as a cost of participating in the auction. Okay, and 
so, uh, but the question is, they might, they pay the entry fee after observing the signal, not before. Mm -hmm. uh, so the entry fee doesn't make a difference to the ranking really, but uh, there, are, there are other results if, uh, uh, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll uh, <coughs> uh, I'm, I'm not certain, I'm not certain. Yeah, so let, let me pass on that. Yeah, so there, there is uh, another question that if there are costless resale markets, is there still a meaningful distinction between common and private values? So there could be a costless, okay, so there are no information costs in the resale market. Yeah, I guess so, yeah. yeah. So, so at a symmetric equilibrium, no, but one could think of asymmetric equilibria when one person will uh, bid high, let's say it's a second price auction, will bid high no matter what, knowing that they can resell later. So they might have a reputation for bear bidding high and, uh, and, and that might create some problems. There, there are multiple equilibria in any of these auctions, which for second price auctions, there, there, there can be when there are two bidders and sometimes when there are more than two bidders also. I see, I see. So there is a, a question by Swaprava which says that uh, uh, how, how Himachal Corporation estimated uh, their value and why they bid so high if they're unable to pay? <laughs> well, I think they're, okay, they, I think generally overestimate, estimated, but their thinking was they will, uh, again, the question is related to the question on resale, that they will find someone to resell it to. I see, yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know what they were thinking, but uh, yeah, but once they saw how much more than the others they bid, their strategy for reselling went out the window and they were, wanted to, uh, I presume they wanted to renege, okay. but I, I, I can't speak for them. Okay, is there any other question? Otherwise I have some. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, I have a, a question. Can I ask? Yeah, go ahead. Sir. Uh, sir, in just the previous example of that Himachal Pradesh Corporation, if the main objective of the buyer is to resell, then bidding so high makes no sense because then in the secondary market, it is likely that the people may not pay the price at which he bought at the first place. So just your comment on that, that if the objective is to resell, then why it makes sense to bid so high? So, so well, when they bid, they didn't realize they bid so high. I mean, they must realize they're bidding on the high side, but uh, not so but, much higher than the, than the others. I mean, there were multiples... Uh, in Bengal, it was 87 times the second highest bid, for instance. Uh, but they must have had some idea that, okay, let's be aggressive. And once we acquired a footprint across, say, all of North India, that becomes very valuable. And maybe Tata or someone else would want to buy all of the licenses from us after that, because we've assembled that package. And that could be one strategy. That's akin to what uh, Craig McCaw did in the US. Uh, when he acquired licenses for cell phones, uh, and then it became worth a lot of money because he went around switching these small, small licenses for small geographic regions. And once he acquired them from others who had it, it became worth a lot more than there was. A, there were synergies, synergies to owning licenses over large parts of India as opposed to just two or three licenses here and there. Yeah. So thank I you. Sir. I had a question, Vic. Uh, so basically, you know, the, the contributions of uh, Milgram and Wilson, if you look at it, you know, the, the first part that you described was about uh, revenue maximization. And the second part, the multi-object part was pretty much about efficiency and so on. So I was wondering if Milgram and Weber paper, at least, uh, do they talk about efficiency? It, like, uh, would those equilibria be efficient and so on? I mean. Do they talk about these things? So, so the the the, the Milgram Weber model is uh, symmetric. <coughs> so, as long as the high bidder wins, it's efficient. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So the symmetric equilibrium would be efficient. Yeah, would be efficient. Yeah. Uh, I have one question. Can I? Yeah. Yeah. 
Sushil, hi. Uh, I I wanted to ask a question which actually precedes your talk on Milgram uh, and Wilson. This is about Meyerson's optimal auction. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, across all mechanisms, I mean auction formats, which can, can be run uh, to get the highest expected revenue. Uh, so is it correct to say that Meyerson's auction guarantees that across all auction formats or only across, you know, uh, mechanisms which are Bayesian incentive compatible and individually rational. So is so, it so, maximizing within the full set or not? Yes, it's amongst all Bayesian incentive compatible and individually rational mechanisms. And it turns out the optimal auction is uh, strategy proof in that class. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, then my question would be like, when the objective of the auctioneer is to maximize expected revenue, why does he care about uh, only the class of incentive compatible uh, rules? I mean, um, could there be a rule which is not incentive compatible and do better in terms of expected revenue in the base well, dash equilibrium? That, so, well, yeah. So, um, how's, how are that uh, would implement such a rule? I mean, how would... Uh, rule might be feasible. I mean, you, you, the bidders, you, you might have a rule which is not incentive compatible. Okay. Yeah. Uh, like, such as just the full extraction one, right? I mean, you could just give it to the highest bidder and charge him the price that could surely raise more revenue, right? And and but it's not there's no way to achieve it. Yeah, I mean, so so the so the, so there's no correlation here. So one can't run uh, uh, Kramer McLeod kind of mechanisms that if do full extraction, yeah. But uh, but uh, I mean you could you could think of any rule, okay, uh, <clears throat> and 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 uh, bidders might find uh, a Nash equilibrium to play play in that rule, yeah. okay. Uh, they may not follow what you think they will follow. They may not uh, truthfully reveal. Uh, so there may be no direct uh, implementation of that mechanism. In and, some equilibrium. Yeah. Yeah. If it's if it has an equilibrium, then the Meyerson auction will do better than that. Okay. As using I mean, the relation principle, you can. Yeah. 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 So, uh, so, uh, so before we end, uh, you know, there, there has been some uh, talk about uh, this Wilson student Ortega. Uh, can you tell us about what his contribution was and how? Uh, um, Milgram and Milgram and Weber is influenced by his work. So, <clears throat> yeah, I was. Uh, he he wrote a, uh, a a PhD thesis primarily on au auctions of different kinds. Uh -huh. uh, so he essentially generalized uh, uh, in the different directions. Milton, uh, Wilson sixty nine. Uh, I don't recall uh, in in one of the chapters. He had a six seven chapters in his thesis. It was a almost a 300 page thesis, uh, which you can find uh, online if you search for it. Uh, and in chapter six, I think, uh, he introduces uh, some asymmetries between the bidders, but then that's not easy to solve, as we know. Uh, some cost of bidding and some other such things. And maybe he had more than two bidders also. I see. I see. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So just one, Last thing yeah. can I add, uh, sir, to the young researchers in the auction theory, could you give some uh, direction or the, say, the topic in which you think that, you know, the rewards are or the marginal gains are high and we can pursue maybe that direction or maybe some paper which you can just want to okay. just okay. as a PhD students. Thank you, sir. Yeah. So, so auction theory is... Uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, giants in economic theory have worked in it. And uh, uh, so a lot of, uh, <coughs> uh, I shouldn't say uh, uh, low hanging fruit, but a lot of important results have already been obtained. So yeah, what's yeah. <laughs> left is uh, not easy, uh, okay. but uh, there are other fields which are, which are I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm giving a talk about auction theory. I'm an auction theorist myself, but I'm sounding as if I'm discouraging you from working in auctions, but I'm just warning you about, uh, it's not an easy field uh, to work in. I mean, you, there might be some innovation you think about in modeling that 
makes uh, currently intractable problems in auction theory, which have to do with multi-object auctions, uh, suddenly uh, easy to fall, and that that will be great if you can do that. But uh, it's 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 uh, uh, the the. the the, the, it'll, be, it'll be a, a, a difficult field to, to furrow. So, I'm sir, thinking. anything like in the broader area of mechanism design where you think that if, say, roots are not low hanging, but at least they are average height, then <laughs> not too high. Yeah. Like in I the think, broader area of mechanism design, then. Thank you, sir. So that think, would be uh, my last question. Yeah, I think market designs has seen a lot of activity over the last uh, several years. Uh, several, uh, perhaps in this uh, last decade or two. So that, that, that's still ongoing. Uh, kind of work Al Roth and his students and others are doing, for instance. Yeah. Okay, so let me just add that uh, Vijay Krishna's auction theory book has uh, most of the stuff that Vic talked about in great detail. And, 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 and so you can refer to it anytime for this also. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so- uh, One small remark, Vic. Uh, yeah. you know, in your uh, Wilson also wrote a very nice uh, paper on social choice uh, in in 1973, I think. Uh, you know, on what happens when you uh, uh, do not have the Pareto principle. Oh yes, 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 and, yes. And and actually, it's it's by no means. Uh, I mean, in uh, I mean, in retrospect, perhaps it's not that surprising, but. Uh, it's uh, it's by no means an obvious result. I mean, it's uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's quite an impressive piece of this thing. But as far as I know, that's the only thing he did in that area. Yes, yes. I yeah. I, I didn't put it because uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, that's the only thing he did in social choice. Yeah. I mean, and it's an important piece. I mean, he also wrote uh, uh, in his early days. His PhD was in operations research. Um, well, his PhD thesis advisor Howard Rafe, who does uh, decision theory, but he did. Uh, uh, quadratic programming. He had an important result in quadratic programming, uh, and he wrote that, and then he started working in economics. I see. I see. Yeah. So he has these one-off pieces that are important that are still cited. Yeah. Then in different know, areas. About stability and all that, right? Uh, on, on the core, uh, on the core with um, private information and the. Yes, that's this econometrica, 1978. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I put that in the game theory, cooperative game theory. Okay. Yeah. So also, this Wilson doctrine, as it is called, that. He now, where did it, where did that come out? So that yeah. came out in a in a in a uh, survey paper, I think, in the Handbook of Game Theory, uh, 1985 paper. It could have been it Wilson is. 85, or mm -hmm. no, that it was some other paper that he wrote in 1985. So it's about uh, uh, it's about uh, telling game theorists that you should not use. Uh, Common knowledge uh, uh, and 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 or, or or reduce the things that you assume to be common knowledge. Reduce the things that you assume to be common knowledge. So it should yeah, not yeah. design of mechanisms should not depend on those things. Yes. Yeah, so so Kramer McLean uh, kind of mechanism wouldn't pass that test, for instance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. 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 Thanks. Thank you. Sure. Very much. Thank you. Very Thank much. you for the questions. Thank you for this thing. Yeah. Thank you. And yep. and the talk will be uploaded to our seminar webpage. So if you want to go back and look at it, or want to ask someone to look at it, please uh, look at it. Okay, thank so you. the slides will be downloadable or not? I mean, uh, from the web page. Yes, yes. I'll put the slides also. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.